Welcome to the program. Today's program is uh, by Todd Ellis. I think uh, Dusty Clayton was able to help uh, get the program lined up, so I'm going to let him come up and introduce the program. Today. He's clapping the most because he didn't have to do anything for his program. So, I wish this was going on about a month and a half ago when I had the program. <laughs> We're going to introduce Jody Arrington. He brought his brother Callie with him today, but I'm not going to, unless y'all want to listen to me speak a whole lot, I think we all want to hear him talk, so we'll jump into it. A few endorsements he's received, which are huge endorsements, in my opinion. IBAT has endorsed Jody, that's the Independent Bankers Association of Texas, uh, so your community banks uh, are represented by that. Farm Bureau has endorsed Jody, as well as the Lubbock Avalanche Journal. So we'll just jump right into it, and I'll let Jody come up here and... Uh, Talk to you guys. Thanks. Well, uh, Dusty, thank you, uh, and the Clayton family for, uh, let me see if I can adjust this. I, I bet you can hear me with that thing. Can y'all hear me okay? So I want to thank the Clayton family for, uh, for all you guys have uh, done to receive me uh, graciously today. And, and uh, it's not often somebody volunteers to take a... a political candidate around, but they're usually, when they see us coming, they turn and go the other way, <laughs> holding on to their wallet or what, something. So, but I guess, you know, being a, a fellow uh, West Texan and a fellow rural West Texan, maybe maybe that's, that's not so bad. Um, uh, I, I, I appreciate what you guys do in service to your uh, community as Rotarians, and, um, you know, that's the way, to me, that's the strength of this country, and and I think we've got it upside down today. I think we've we've, put, we've emphasized a distant, universal, sort of all-encompassing, all-empowering federal government uh, as the solution to every answer uh, uh, of a very problem, as opposed to empowering states with states' rights in the Tenth Amendment and empowering communities and empowering individuals and empowering our um, small businesses. So I think we've, we've, we've got it upside down today, and that's something we'll talk about. Um, uh, let me just give you some background on me, and then I'll make a few comments about why I'm doing this, what drives me, what I think are the most important issues, and then uh, we'll open it up for questions. I'd, I'd rather have a, a dialogue than just me give you a, a speech today. I'm sure you've heard enough and had enough of political speeches. Let me let me also say uh, thanks to Brett and the um, Bammer, right? I got to go out there and see uh, the seed company. It's just really impressive. Uh, went to see another a small business today, uh, the uh, Evolve, the apparel company. I mean, it's just really exciting what you guys have going on here in Muleshoe. And again, as a kid that grew up in Plainview, Texas, I, I really do feel at home uh, when I'm running around uh, the community, meeting people, going to coffee shops, going to businesses, cotton gins, uh, because this is where I'm from. Let me start there. This is home. This is home. And, and I'll tell you, after being with President Bush for 10 years and being in that, some might call it a cesspool, some might use other terms that we can't use for the camera. Hi, Mom. I'm not going to use the language. My dad might if he were here, but it's, it's just terribly dysfunctional. And, um, but, um, you know, I was raised here in, in this, in this uh, wonderful place with the greatest people in all the country, with the values of hard work and faith and family and independence and that's been instilled in me. That's who I am. That's just not where I'm from. That's who I am. I am a West Texan. Um, you know, I'm proud to be from a place that, that does so much for our country. And uh, I think our country values rural America and places like District 19 too, too little. They don't, I don't think we have a voice, and I don't think we uh, have leadership in our country that, that truly values the food, fuel, and fiber that we produce here in West Texas to keep our country strong and keep in, keeping our country safe because it is a national security issue. But that story isn't told, Brett. Um, 
But I think the greatest thing that we produce in West Texas are people that have the right values that our country needs. And so I'll reiterate, the first uh, reason I'm doing this is because I am a West Texan. And West Texans need a voice, they need a strong voice, they need a strong advocate, and they need a champion for the things that matter to us, our values and our interests. Um, so I grew up the son of a tractor salesman uh, and a school teacher. I have two brothers. My younger brother's back there. I used to call him my little brother, but he's 6'5 now, and I just want to give him his due respect. He's now bigger, stronger, and better looking. Uh, and I'm not going to try to compete with young kids. He has four children. I have three. I'm going to stop. I'll let you win that one. <laughs> uh, my older brother, I'm 43. I've got an older brother that's uh, 44. He's a pastor. Went to uh, Southwestern Seminary and felt called to be in, uh, in the ministry from an early age. And he's doing really well. We're really proud of him. He's, he's one of my heroes, uh, spiritually speaking. I'd say he's my, my mentor. So I'm grateful of that. I went to Texas Tech where my mom and dad met. Uh, my dad played basketball back in the late 50s. And Gerald Myers was actually his roommate, if any of you guys followed Texas Tech basketball. I went to work uh, alongside a fellow West Texan in service to my state and country in George W. Bush. Spent 10 years with him, about half the time as governor and the other half as president. Um, had the privilege of being a, a White House advisor to him and helping him assemble his his team in agriculture and energy, his leadership team, and um, served as chief of staff at the FDIC, uh, where we, we did what we thought Republicans were supposed to do. We spent the money like it was our own, and we ran it like it was our own business. So we downsized the agency because there was bloat and, and inefficiency. We cut the workforce by 25% which represented tens of millions of dollars in reduced spending. And uh, we led an effort to reduce regulatory burden for small banks all across the country. And, uh, and then we helped pass deposit insurance reform that strengthened our community banks. So I would tell you that um, while I, sure, I made a lot of mistakes along the way, I feel like every job that I've had, every leadership role I've had, I've, I've left the place better than I found it. And um, I always had good teams. I uh, served along some great leaders, and, um, and God's grace has always been sufficient for me. I came back here to raise my family. You see the pictures on the cards that I passed out. Um, I was vice chancellor at Texas Tech, uh, and uh, spent about eight years at Texas Tech, and, and now I'm president of a health care company. Uh, I'm actually president of the holding company for Grace Health System. And... Um, one of my areas of focus has been on bringing health care via telemedicine to rural communities where places maybe like Muleshoe and others that you don't have specialty care, we can pipe that in alongside your primary care physician and not have to travel and we can help bend the cost curve. We can also provide greater access to care. That's 21st century health care and it's exciting and I'm, I'm glad to be a part of that. So. I told you that one of the reasons I'm, I'm running is because I love West Texas. And I believe I can make a difference for West Texas and be the voice that we don't have in Washington. But the other is those three kids in that picture. You know, I'm worried that my children and I guess your children and grandchildren are not going to grow up in a safe and strong and free America. At least not the safe, strong, and free America that you all grew up in and that I have thus far. I think that's real. I think it's real. I tell people that our country, the window's closing, and we, we don't just have a national security crisis along the border with ISIS. We don't just have an economic crisis with our $19 trillion in debt and the reckless runaway irresponsible, unconscious, you know, just <clears throat> spending spree that will be the millstone around the necks of our children. We have an identity crisis in our country. we got to decide if we want to be the next member of the European Union with the European Union-style debt, European Union-style tax rates, European Union-style culture, European Union-style 
let's just say average. Like America is not an average country, never has been, never should be. And the, the framers the framers had a formula for that. And it was a, sort of the principal philosophy that pervaded the sacred documents, like the Declaration, the Constitution were, was limited government. Why? Because they believed in the limitless potential of the American people. They believed in we the people. And that if you unleashed the economy instead of taxing our jobs overseas or putting layer after layer of trillions of dollars of regulatory burden, then we'd be the envy of the world, the economic engine of the world, the laboratory of innovation of the world. That's exactly what America's been as long as we've been limited in our scope and scale of the federal government. And so we need to unleash the creative energy and the entrepreneurial spirit. We need to get the great America back. We need to, to be the shiny city on the hill. And uh, we can. The good news is it's, it's, not, it's not rocket science. It doesn't require nuanced and sophisticated policies. It requires us to return to that document, the Constitution, and actually govern accordingly, as we talked about in our earlier meeting today. If we respect rule of law, if we respect states' sovereignty to determine their values and the culture and future for their families, we'd be, we'd be better off. And, uh, and if we didn't think government was the answer for all of our problems, we'd be better off. The list goes on and on, uh, but we have so strayed from it that the window's going to close on us in the next few years, several years. I think this is the most important election of my lifetime. And uh, when it closes, I think we'll be uh, inexorably changed in, in our identity. And I'm not going to sit back and let it happen. And uh, why do I think I'm the guy for, for you, for your community, for, for, for this community, for your families? Because I am from West Texas. Because I've served well in the opportunities I've had to serve with President Bush at Texas Tech, whether it was growing Texas Tech alongside my team there, Ken Hans and others. Because when I had a leadership role, um, I did what I think leaders are supposed to do, lead deliver results, not just talk about things. You know, I, this, is, this, is, this is part of, you know, being a, uh, a candidate. As you go around, you talk. But the real question for, I think, the folks like you guys who are voting for the person who's going to represent you in Washington, where the West Texas jersey up there is, what have you actually done in your career that has left this place better, that, is, that, that, that was that, that was more reflective of our conservative values. And I've got that record, and I'm happy to talk about it today uh, when I open up for questions. So that's my, um, that's my passion. Service, leadership, uh, leaving places better than you found it. Um, and um, I think our country's in awfully bad shape right now. But we can get it back. We can get it back. We just have to have the right kind of people up there that are putting America first. Say it again, putting America first, not their party, not their party, not their partisanship, not their self-interest, putting America first and uh, solving some problems. Because we kicked the can down the road so much, guys, that I don't know that my kids are going to get that opportunity that you've had. And I'm mad about it. I'm really, I'm mad about it. The more I talk about it, the more I'm going to get angry. So I'm going to stop, let you guys ask some questions. Um, uh, thanks again for the opportunity just to share my heart, my thoughts about this really important election and why I think I'm the, the right guy for you and, and, and this, this wonderful community. So with that, um, fire away. I got a question about you mentioned health care. You know, it's sure hard to attract good health care professionals to our community. And I've read something about Teledoctor, telemedicine. How, how do you foresee that working and opening up? Um, I think that's the future. I think you're going to see more um, telehealth um, delivery services. Um, I think that uh, teledoc is a different 
uh, business model than the model that we have at, at, at Grace Health System. Teledoc is where you just you you can call up and you can get you know you can talk to a nurse practitioner maybe it's a, maybe a physician and the way we do business here because Texas has different laws than other states they're pretty restrictive actually they're they're one of the most restrictive and they they believe that you need to have um, there needs to be continuity and care so that 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 one requirement is that there is some um, relationship back to the primary care physician of the people uh, who you're serving. So it's just, you can't just call somebody up and get a prescription. You have to have that relationship. And I think that's good. Um, I think that's good. I think it's certainly uh, probably a, a more responsible and safe way to do it. Uh, we'll see if, if we can open it up beyond that, but that's how it is today. So, so in other words, from home, you just get on the internet and... Have yeah. a camera and you talk to the doctor. Or yeah, and then we communicate back to the primary care physician because we have a relationship with them as well, not just with you. You just I don't see. call me in a, out in the, the ether somewhere. I've I've got a relationship with your, your doctor, and, and quite frankly, the doc the docs will the primary the medical community is is more receptive to that when you are tying it back in. So there's a lot of reasons for that. Some are political and some are practical and safety reasons but yes that's it we, we also have a system today i think i mentioned this at my last meeting but where we do remote patient monitoring so it's not just that i can pipe in specialty care where you can't get specialty care maybe here in mule shoot so we we get you on a video maybe your primary care person is there maybe it's a physician maybe it's a nurse practitioner and we consult the other thing we do, though, is remote patient monitoring. So if you have somebody that's got uh, uh, multiple disease states, these are the sickest people in our, in our country, and we have a statewide service to, to some of these folks. And what's happened is, oftentimes these folks are the, they're the highest utilizers of healthcare resources, and they'll go to the emergency room when, when they really don't need to. They just need somebody to talk to them and say, let's increase your medicine, or have you taken your medicine? And, and uh, it's, it's high intensity. So there's $2 billion in Texas that are spent unnecessarily because folks primarily in this group overutilize the emergency room. So we're doing tele-monitoring with them to this really cool, they wear you know, remote, there's, re there's a Bluetooth a technology that will send information to our health care uh, center, our care center, and then we engage from there. And, and we're already seeing good good results. I mean, we're new at this, but it's exciting. Very exciting. Especially for rural America. Especially for remote places. It's harder to get to a specialty care doc. Yes, sir? It seems clear that uh, <clears throat> in our society today, in our country, we're so polarized in so many ways, we're not going to get our own way and make any progress at all. None of us are going to get our own way. What kind of bipartisan, what kind of experience do you have dealing with folks that are your political opponents to try to do something good and not demonize each other? So let, let me say a couple things. That's, a really, that's at the heart of a lot of questions I get. We talked a little bit about it in our last meeting. Um, let me... First, make it clear to everybody here so that you know who you're voting for. I'd rather, you, I'd rather you know who I am and decide not to vote for me than to vote for me and think I'm somebody I'm not. Okay? So, you're not going to get to the right of me. Ask me any question you want. I'll be way over here, socially and fiscally. Okay? Just how I was raised uh, as, a, as a person who believes the Bible is the Word of God, informs my policy decisions. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why I'm over here, but this is where I am ideologically like if Jody was was able to make all the decisions and everybody trusted those decisions in one person and I was making them this is how we would be as a country but guess what it's not the way our system was designed and not everybody thinks like Jody so I have to be able to to move and meet people and and of all all along the spectrum if I'm gonna actually solve a problem Texas Tech is not as far from Congress, but we were declining in enrollment growth for three years, the first time we've ever declined like we did at Texas Tech. We were at 27,000 when I got there with Ken Hansen. 
Hansa asked me to, to lead the effort to turn the enrollment growth around because it was going to be very important. We were having some real pressures on uh, higher education was getting cut. We needed, we needed to bring more students in for that reason. We also just thought it was better to have more Red Raiders in the marketplace, quite frankly, as a tech rat. Um, I was chairman of the Enrollment Growth Task Force. I had deans and department chairs, and, and I, I, I guarantee you there were some Bernie Sanders people in that, in, on that team. Uh, there may have been people to the left of Bernie Sanders, for all I know. But you know what? This is how I've always led. I've never treated somebody like they were, if they dis, didn't agree with my far you know, right, staunch conservative beliefs and ideology, I never made them feel less than a Republican. I never made a Democrat feel less of a, as an American. Never. And I've never made a Christian feel less of a Christian. I hope not. I mean, maybe, maybe they left feeling that way, but my, I don't believe that is consistent with how I've led. Now, I'm pretty strong about my beliefs. I uh, like to think I'm pretty compelling <clears throat> when I'm making the arguments for why you need to be closer here. But we just got together and we solved the problem. Turned it around. We had record-breaking enrollment for the last seven, eight years. Save and accept that. One year, we broke the record every year. Now we have seven, roughly, thousand new students at Texas Tech. Why? Because we actually just had a goal, had a plan, executed on it, and, and tried to figure out, focus more on attacking the problem than attacking our, each other. That's just one example. I'd say the same thing about cutting the government. When, I, when we were there, we did what we, we did. What we, we did. I just explained it, but we had lawsuits. We had the union groups. We, it wasn't easy. It would have been much easier to let, that, let that somebody else deal with that and us be talking about something sexier like deposit insurance reform and come back and say, we passed legislation. Hey, we need to pass less legislation. We need less laws. Let's enforce the ones we have, and then let's clean up the bureaucracy, and let's, let's, take, a, let's take a meat axe to some of this federal bureaucracy that we've created, because that's what's killing our economy and, and quenching the spirit of Americans. Anyway, that's a long... I'm trying to filibuster so nobody will ask me another question. Because uh, I, se I can sense it's, gonna, it's getting harder. The questions are getting harder. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Yes. Again, there are some things, though, and I want you to know this. There are some things that you don't compromise on. For me, I have moral imperatives that I just, you know, Planned Parenthood and, 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 and what, they, what that organization represents, which is a stain, in my view, moral stain on this country, um, I, I have some areas that I, I, I will not compromise. There is no meeting halfway. There's no Ronald Reagan. I love to quote him. Ronald Reagan said, "You know, um, I never, you know, to get 100 percent of what, what I wanted, but I'd take 80 percent and come back and fight for the other 20." I think that's a reasonable Ronald Reagan common sense approach to governing in a country like this. Um, but there are some things I will not. Uh, there's no 80 percent of the life uh, of a child, so. But there is a vast uh, 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 space out there to find some, some, uh, some movement forward to solving problems, I think. Well, I, I successfully filibustered today, and I just want to thank all the people at home watching. Um, any other questions? I'm serious. I'm here as long as you guys uh, will, will take me. I, I got a question. Yes, sir. You've been talking all morning, and I haven't been able to ask you anything. Cole, don't be saying I've been talking all morning and not letting you have a word in catchwise. Uh, yesterday I heard Mary Robertson's uh, ad on the radio basically kind of bashing, bashing you. Almost I feel like that's what they do up in Washington. And uh, I know you had a deal in the paper this morning, but I had a chance to read it. Yeah. What's been your response to that? <clears throat> Uh, well, I appreciate you uh, bringing up the issue that I'm being, I'm being bashed. Uh, but I will not be bashful in responding. Uh, first of all, let me say this. I'm sick of Washington and politics and the way politics are played. Americans are sick of it. We don't know who to trust and believe. We're sick of both sides. And here our country is just in the death spiral. And th this... I'll say that, um, that, 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 that the ads that have been taken out on TV and radio are just, um, they're either completely false 
or they are um, mischaracterized. That's probably the, the, the least that they are. Um, but as we say in plain view, they ain't right. <laughs> and this is how, this is politics. This is the politics that has created a country that is so polarized that we can't get anything done because people just, they're sick of it. So it's, I'm trying as a person, as a man who was raised by Gene and Betty Arrington in Plainview, Texas, and who, whose goal, supreme goal, is to glorify Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, to not get in the mud and, and, and respond in kind as best as I can. But I will, I will uh, correct the record. So I don't know. Raise your hands if you've heard the uh, attack ads. I'd just like to know how, how widespread it is. Look at that. Unbelievable. Wow. Well, you know what? Uh, my opponent has spent uh, over $800,000 on this election. And uh, I don't have the money to put an ad out and try to defend my honor and my name, my reputation. So I'll just do my best to just take one example so that the good people of Muleshoe can go tell your friends and family that this is a good guy and is a strong leader. And um, that's what I'm going to bank on. So, <clears throat> I don't know whether to start with the most ridiculous or the most, you know, but let me, let me say, for example, uh, he said that I used $90,000 to redecorate my office. Okay. When I was promoted, after leading the effort to turn around enrollment at Texas Tech from Chief of Staff to Vice Chancellor, because Tier 1 and becoming a national Tier 1 research university was the main goal, I think this is the highest compliment I could be paid because I'm not a research guy, but the, but the Chancellor, with the Board's approval, made me uh, the Vice Chancellor for Research, Commercialization, and Federal Relations. So we had to combine three offices and they put me as the head of it because they, they believed that that was the way to do this to get to Tier 1. So they have a bank building. Y'all know about the bank building on 19th and University Bank of America. It's Texas Tech owns the building. Well, it cost $90,000 to after Merrill Lynch moved out of their floor, uh, that first floor, to put new carpet in, put paint in, put light sockets in, put data. It was... $11, I believe the paper reported, $11 a square foot. The renovation of the floor above, the facilities and planning office for Texas Tech University was $17 a square foot. Ask me if there were any decorative items in my, on my list. Zero. So it's just unfortunate because here I am at Rotary talking about I didn't have any decorative items. I didn't waste that money. It was approved by the Chancellor. It was approved by the Board of Regents Committee for Facilities. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the banking crisis, the bubble burst, and the economy tanked because of my leadership at the FDIC. I wasn't even there when Superior failed, what he talked about this morning. I didn't have a chance to tell the media that because I didn't even know what he was talking about. The FDIC made subprime loans that created hundreds of millions of dollars in crisis. The FDIC didn't make loans. The FDIC insures deposits and regulates banks. How many people do you think I'll be able to get in front of and tell these things? and correct the record. I could keep going. Every one of them, save and except the one where he had me talking, saying, hi, my name is Jody Arrington, and I've, I have been to Washington, and I've operated in that environment successfully in achieving outcomes that are good for our country and for this region. That's true. I stand by it. Does that, does that, does that help anybody in this room at all? Let me ask you this. Raise your hand if when you heard that ad for the first time, you believed it or you thought you were or you were suspicious of the of, of somebody that's putting an ad up like that. If you're suspicious because maybe they don't want to talk about their record, raise your hand. Okay. Well, I hope the rest of the voters are, are equally suspicious. You know. I got a lot of things you can come after me about. You don't, I, ask me. I mean, I can give you. My dad was called me. He said, "Man, I can give him a lot of stuff to come after you." But just make sure it's on on facts. Just make sure it's on facts. We don't have time for that. West Texans are smarter than that. You know what I'm counting on? 
I'm not counting on raising any money in here to, to put another ad out. I'm done with ads for this, this cycle. I'm counting on the good judgment of West Texans who see through that kind of baloney. And I'm counting on God to fight my battles. So, that's my answer. I probably should have just said that at the beginning, but <laughs> felt like I needed to say something about it. Other questions, comments, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Yes, sir. It looks like you made a major commitment here to having three young children at home. And I, my question is your long term goals. Because all of us, I think, in my opinion, are looking for somebody to back, yeah. to stand for rural America, fight for our rights, and our culture, because we're all based mostly around our culture. And uh, as politicians, you have to make alliances. And if you win, which I'm going to call Babe Ruth shot in the way and say, we're going to back you. All right. And, uh, Say that loud enough for the camera. Could you get, could you get a close up on him? Hold on a second. He's going to point where I'm going to make this whole run. Ladies and gentlemen. But what I don't want to see is what we got right now. And the politician been in office too long, where he kind of gave up. And I'm talking about Nogbauer. He'd been in office a long time, did this right. Very conservative, had a lot of good points. But if you talk to him in the last two years. He's like been defeated yeah. because of all the bureaucracy he has to go through and nothing gets done. Mm. And we want to back somebody that's going to go for it, but we don't want to get in that mix yeah. where, you know, he has some power right now because he's been in office so long. And it's going to be a tough road for you. Yes. But don't get burned out. Well, uh, you made me want to resign already. And I'm, <laughs> I haven't even gotten well, I'm going to back you, so don't resign. No, no, no. <laughs> No, listen, here, here's, here, here, let me just say, like, I appreciate what you're saying, and I, 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 I agree. It is a beatdown. I mean, when I worked for the president, it was 24-7. That's, that's all I've ever known in these jobs is 24-7. My wife and, and I met there. She's from New Orleans, actually. Um, and you're right, having those three kids, I'll, I'll tell you, we, it was not uh, without much prayer and consultation with each other and friends and family that we made the decision to do it. And if she said I wasn't in, I wouldn't do it. But but she knows that this is a calling for me. Okay? So I'll just say she's all in. But I'll also say I'm in the sweet spot right now, man. I am in the sweet spot. I'm 43 years old. I've had an experience of a lifetime with President Bush at Texas Tech. Think about it. Agriculture... 40 years in my family. It was the livelihood of my family. Healthcare. President of a healthcare company. Energy. I'm on a Win Energy Board. was president of that Win Energy Board when I was at Texas Tech. Uh, higher Education. Former Vice Chancellor at Texas Tech. What about uh, any political experience? Worked in Washington for President Bush and helped shrink bureaucracy, cut spending. So, I worked. Here's the other thing. Mike Conaway, talk about agriculture? You're right. We don't have a voice. We didn't even talk about that. The crisis here is that agriculture and farming, and cotton farmers in particular right now, they've got no voice. And our country, the leaders in our country, they do not value the 24, millions of jo uh, 24 million jobs that ag creates, the abundant supply of food to feed uh, you know, cost effectively our people. The, the, the food and fiber independence, it gives us a national security strength. On and on, they, they, we've lost it generationally, that, that, that understanding and appreciation of value. What do we need to do? We need somebody that's a champion. And this is why I'm honored that, you know, that the Farm Bureau stand with me. Their mission is to be the voice of agriculture. I said, you know, that's my mission. Among other things is to be the voice for agriculture. So I'm 43, I'm full of, you know, lots of energy. And um, I got this, this, this is my skin in the game right here. And that's my asset test at the end of the day, is uh, looking at Nathan and Jane and Hank the Tank and saying, Dad did everything he could today to make America stronger. He did everything he could today to make sure you could go raise your family and start your career in West Texas. Dad did that today. That's my acid test. That's good enough for you guys. Vote for Arrington for Congress. 
and uh, and let's go get our country back. God bless you guys. Thanks for your time.